When the Dendro element came out, we had a bunch of characters who tried to utilize the new reactions. Tainari and Sino and Quicken, Nilu and Kaveh and Bloom, Kuki and Hyperbloom, etc. I was hoping Dea would fall under the burning niche, but I was sorely mistaken. Wait, have I said this line before? I was hoping Dia would fall under the Burgeon niche, but I was sorely mistaken. I already made a video describing my idea for a Burgeon unit, but now it's time for us to explore the last of the Dendro reactions. Welcome back to another episode of Genshin's Character Creator. Today, we're gonna meet Asha, my custom unit tailored towards the Burning reaction. I've had this idea for a few months, but with the release of the new 4.6 Burning set, and a few, uh, <clears throat> rumors flying around, I felt it was a good time to cover my interpretation before an official unit gets released. Of course, with this being a completely original character, we get to explore backstory as well. For the gameplay related stuff, here's a list of disclaimers when it comes to making character kits. Take a quick pause if you need to read. And as always, these will be in the description along with timestamps, social media links, and music credits. Alright, let's meet Asha. First off, her weapon and element. I decided to make her a polearm user, not for any gameplay reasons, it was mainly because of an aesthetic decision. But polearm impact exists for a reason, so she's still going to have amazing options. As for her element, this is going to be a little interesting, but I'm actually going to make her Dendro instead of Pyro. I was initially hesitant to do this because it felt thematically wrong to make the unit Dendro when the burning reaction feels more Pyro oriented. But then I remember that Nilo is a Hydro unit who specializes in Bloom, a reaction that many people would consider to be a Dendro oriented reaction. Additionally, while burning can initially be triggered via Dendro or Pyro, its aura is maintained when you keep applying Dendro. So Ash's kit will revolve around consistent Dendro application to maintain the aura. Ash's kit isn't going to be like Fremenet or Chevre's where it just takes advantage of the burning reaction. It's going to directly alter its effects and damage, similar to Nilu. As such, I chose to make her a 5-star unit. Her ascension set will be a 28.8% boost in attack. Her special title is Glowing Stamin, and her constellation is either called Flore Arantiago or Arantiago Flore. And hopefully, one of those two translates to Orange Blossom. Once again, this is based on a few Google Translate inputs, so accuracy is probably baseline at best. Starting off, we have her Exploration passive. Once the player obtains Asha, all seeds planted in the Serenity Pot have their growth time sped up by 35%. In a simpler term, the process to grow a seed will take a little under 2 days instead of 3. I'm not really sure who actually uses the gardening system, but this will definitely make farming materials a little bit easier. Asha's skill is going to be the source of her Dendro application and damage. Upon casting, it will create a Marigold field, dealing AoE Dendro damage. The Marigold field will continuously pulse every 4 seconds, dealing Dendro damage to all opponents within the radius. However, if an enemy or ally within the area takes burning damage, the Marigold field will enter the Frenzied state, in which its pulsing damage will occur once every 1 second instead. This special state will last for only 1 second after burning is no longer present. All party members in the field will gain the Embered Pollen effect, in which they will only take 5% burning damage from all sources. Only one Marigold field can exist at a time. At its baseline, the field will focus on Dendro application instead of damage. You can theoretically use her in a non-burning team, but her application instead becomes very slow, making it only good as an occasional Dendro applier for maybe an Aggravate comp. She'll have a special ICD, where it applies Dendro every 2 seconds or 2 hits, which basically means that in a frenzied state, every other hit will apply Dendro. The goal is to ensure that Dendro is constantly being applied, so if we need to make it so the application is every one second or every one hit, I will certainly be okay with that. As I cover later on, Ash's kit will revolve around increasing burning damage. The additional burning resistance is there to prevent players from accidentally melting themselves if they get too close to an enemy. It has a 6 second cooldown but a 20 second duration, so maintaining uptime on the field should be absolutely no problem. Think of it like Albedo's skill. High uptime, but the cooldown is low to allow for easy replacement should the enemy step out of the field. As for particle generation, it can create a particle once every 3 seconds, which results in 10 dendro particles over its 30 second duration. When Asha casts her burst, she will send forth a barrage of crimson petals, which deal dendro damage to opponents. If the enemy is burning, this damage will have a guaranteed crit hit. I would say this ability can be compared to Nilu in terms of importance. It's there if you want the extra damage and dendro application, but for the most part you don't need to care about it. Her skill and passives will be the main part of her kit. Still, it can be pretty easy to use every rotation, since I'll be giving it a 40 cost burst with a 12 second cooldown. Once again, unless you really care about doing that extra damage, ER is meaningless. Ash's A1 is where the magic happens. If you've seen my last episode of Signature Weapons, you already know what will happen here. When Asha is in the party, 
50% of her attack that doesn't exceed 5,000 will become a flat damage bonus to all sources of burning damage. You want to stack as much attack on Asha as possible, and EM for any party member becomes more of a secondary stat. This damage buff requires nothing other than the reaction itself, so even a team comp like Burn Melt can dish out hefty damage on the side. Burning deals 4 ticks per second. With this passive, Asha at the maximum 5,000 attack deals an additional 10,000 damage a second. Realistically, you'd reach around 3,000 attack, which is around 6,000 damage a second. Asha's A4 is going to be a buff to her personal and burning damage. For every party member who is a Dendro or Pyro unit, not including Asha, Asha receives one stack of Reactive Singe. Each stack increases all burning damage by 50% of Asha's attack, and Asha's skill damage by 25% of her attack. Maximum of 3 stacks. I didn't directly limit the party to be only Pyro and Dendro units, but with this passive, there's a clear incentive to run units of those elements. My main idea was that if Asha was in a team comp like Burn Melt, her burning is mainly there to provide the aura for the Cryo DPS to melt. But the more you stack Dendro and Pyro users, Asha becomes the DPS. In a full burning team, her burning damage scales off 200% of her attack. At 3000 attack, that's a whopping 24,000 burning damage a second. Additionally, her personal damage is increased, allowing her skill to deal additional damage on the side. I'm hopeful that Asha is already a powerful unit at C0, but of course we have her constellations to cover. At C1, hitting an opponent with Asha's skill or burst decreases Dendro and Pyro resistance by 10% for 5 seconds. If an enemy is under the burning effect, this effect is doubled. This is just a small res shred to provide extra personal and burning damage to enemies. If your teammates are one of the two elements, this bonus will also benefit them. At C2, if the active party member falls below 30% HP, a glass flora shield based on 350% of Asha's attack will be generated. This special shield will have both a 250% Dendro and Pyro absorption bonus. The shield will last for 10 seconds, and this effect can be triggered once every 12 seconds. Once the shield disappears or is destroyed, it will explode, dealing 300% of Asha's attack as Dendro damage. This is just a failsafe just in case your party member gets low. The shield being able to absorb Pyro effectively should help against taking burning damage if you get too close to a burning enemy, and it provides an additional instance of damage afterwards. At C3, Asha's skill is increased by 3 levels. This is a pretty good boost to her personal damage. At C4, the active character gains an 8% elemental damage bonus while in the Marigold field. If the field is in the Frenzied state, increase the bonus by an additional 8%. If the active character is a Pyro or Dendro unit, increase the bonus by another 8%. At its fullest potential, this constellation provides a 24% damage bonus to the active character. Naturally, it stacks in burning comps, which should be easy when Asha is in the party. C5 will increase Asha's burst by 3 levels. Once again, it's a buff to her personal damage, but ultimately it's her worst constellation. And at C6, when Asha is in the Marigold field, her basic attacks gain a Dendro infusion. This effect lasts for 3 seconds after Asha leaves the field. Additionally, when Asha is in the party, all burning damage now has a chance to crit. For every Dendro and Pyro user in the party, including Asha, the crit rate and crit damage will be increased by 10% and 20% respectively. This specific bonus will cap out at 40% crit rate and 80% crit damage, but it can stack with other bonuses that grant a similar effect. So with this constellation, Asha gains an infusion for on-field playstyles, but also an effect similar to Nahida C2, where transformative reactions can crit. In this case, it's just burning. With a full party of Pyro and Dendro, the crit output is pretty high, but realistically you might only have 2 or 3 stacks of the passive. I added a special mechanic where it can stack with Nahida C2, so if you run these two together with their respective constellations, the crit output is 60% crit rate and 180% crit damage, which is an insane boost in burning damage. I know that Nahida C2 says the crit ratios are locked, but I mean, when was there really any harm in buffing burning? Besides. This is a very premium synergy, so I feel like it's a good reward for those who save primos or spend money. With constellations out of the way, let's talk about artifact builds. Asha is going to have a focus on two main builds, a burning DPS or a dendro DPS. If you want to focus on her burning damage, full attack stats all the way, and then go for EM stats to boost that damage further. If you're going for higher dendro damage output, then your build gets slightly more complicated. Attack dendro crit is the best main stat combo with EM attack and crit substats. Overall though, the attack build is much better since it will improve the output of both damage sources. For artifact sets, there are going to be three best options. If you're going for a set that boosts burning the most, a two-piece combo of the 18% attack sets will be the most reliable. Her best option for a Dendro DPS is going to be Golden Troop, due to the 70% crit damage bonus. Obviously, this is meant for an off-field playstyle, and you wouldn't be boosting her burning damage as much. 
Unfinished Reverie is a great set for overall damage, since it boosts her attack for burning, and the 50% bonus will apply to both her skill and burst damage. For other alternative sets, Gilded Dreams provides attack and EM. Lava Walker technically works since the Burning Aura counts as Pyro, but at that point, Reverie does the same thing for more bonuses. And if you want just a simple support build, Noblesse, Tenacity, or Deepwood can all be decent options with really good uptime. With artifacts out of the way, we can take a look at some of her best weapons. Starting off with free-to-play, Moonpiercer can be a good choice. Since Asha is a Dendro unit, she can proc the effect in any team and even use a Leaf's attack bonus for herself if she wants. Missive Windspear is also a good option for its attack and EM bonuses, but those who didn't play in 3.1 might not have it available. Other attack or EM weapons like Royal Spear or Katane Crossspear can work as general stat sticks. For 4-star gacha weapons, Dragon's Bane is a great choice. Chances are most people have a copy, and since burning is considered pyro, it will improve Asha's personal damage as well as her burning damage, assuming she's the one triggering the reactions. Other options like Lithic Spear or Prospector's Drill have attack stats, which scale with Asha's kit. For 5-star options, Calamity Queller provides some really good stats with a really high base attack and more attack stats. And when she's off-field, even more attack stats. Vortex Vanquisher relies on Asha being on-field and having a shielder, but she also gains attack from it. Finally, Primordial Jade has a decently high base attack and attack bonuses, but this one requires her to be on-field to get and maintain the stack. If you want to build Asha as a Dendro DPS, I won't list all of the options, but generally any sort of attack, damage, or crit weapon is a good option for her. As always, here is a weapon concept for Asha. Sunny Blossom is going to have a 741 base attack, along with a 16.5% attack bonus. For its passive, when the user is near a burning enemy, their attack increases by 3-6% to every second, up to a maximum of 30-60%. to At max stacks, increase a user's elemental skill crit rate by 28-56%. to This effect lasts for 8 seconds and can be triggered while off-field. It's a pretty simple passive, but incredibly niche, as it requires a user to be in a dedicated burning team. The attack bonus works to increase her burning and personal damage even further, and the skill crit rate works especially well if you're going to be using her as the main damage dealer. If you use this weapon, keep in mind that her burst damage guarantees a crit hit on burning enemies, meaning that I would recommend focusing more on crit damage since you'd have two sources of crit rate. The initial alternative users people might consider using are Hu Tao and Arlecchino, and while this may be a decent weapon for them, we have to remember that since they would require burning to proc the passive, they can't apply Hydro to the enemy to vaporize, making it harder to get all stacks. Additionally, the skill crit is useless on them since most of their damage comes from normal and charge attacks. Shenhan's actually going to make better use of the weapon because of the high base attack and attack substat. However, the passive is not going to work as well on her. Since her team's focus on cryo, she's not going to perform well in burning teams, even if that team is burn melt. Finally, we can discuss Ash's team comps. Just a reminder that these are archetypes and not specific comps. There are a few variations of burning we can cover. For the basic general burning teams, we can start off with using Asha in a double pyro comp. In this team, it provides pyro resonance which grants 25% attack, perfect for the additional burning and personal damage, and this also helps your team's overall burning output. Additionally, with a double dendro team, it might be easier to maintain the burning aura since you apply more dendro to a burning enemy. In both of these teams, it might be recommended to have an animal user on VV to decrease pyro resistance on the enemy, boosting your burning damage and any pyro DPS's damage. Alternatively, you can run full Pyro and Dendro to max out Ash's A4. Next, let's cover the possible teams for Burn variants. The first is a Burn Melt comp. This would require a Cryo DPS like Ganyu or Risley, Asha, a Pyro user, and a Flex slot. It works like any other Burn Melt comp. Trigger Burning and use the underlying Pyro Aura to melt. The main bonus is that Asha will buff that burning damage. The next variant is an Over Burn comp, which combines Burning and Overload. The Burning Aura will be the dominant one, allowing you to deal consistent damage with Asha. Meanwhile, your Electro unit will trigger overloads. The most notable characters are Sino, EM Raiden, and Kuki. Animal units are a bit more valuable here since they can VV Swirl Pyro to boost the burning and overload damage, since both of those are considered Pyro damage. The last variant I have is a Burn Vape comp. This comp would be Asha, a Hydro DPS, Pyro, and either a Dendro, Pyro, or Animal Flex slot. This comp will be a lot harder to pull off with Asha because she only applies 1 unit of Dendro, while the staple Dendro plier Nahida applies 1.5 units. This means there's less Dendro to maintain a burning aura for your Hydro DPS to vape. The other thing is that in that comp, burning isn't a dominant reaction, so Asha's skill, burst, or A1 passive won't get as much of a bonus. There's a lot of nuances to this team comp, but in short you would get burning to help with vaporize, and a few bloom cores which are good for extra damage. 
There's a variant of this comp where instead of an animal unit to swirl pyro, you use an electro unit to hyperboom the cores you generate. I forgot what this team comp is called, it's some kind of cooking term I think. But it runs into the same problem as Burn Vape, where Asha would have trouble with it because she applies less Dendro than Nahida. Overall, I predict Asha would shine most in teams where you don't have to be super meticulous with the elemental gauge system. She wants to be in teams where the burning aura is highly present, and those teams are generally the more comfortable ones to play anyway. That's everything we have for gameplay, so now let's get into the story section. Take a few seconds to read all the disclaimers regarding story and fan art regarding this character. I like trying out different forms of storytelling, so this one would be in the form of a fairy tale. Kind of like the one we saw in Scaramouche's interlude chapter. There's no hidden Ermin soul meaning by the way, it's just the medium I'm using to tell Ash's story. Alright, let's begin. This story is called The Lonely Crystal Fly. Once upon a time, there lived two swarms of crystal flies. One group, called the green flies, had luscious green wings just like the trees. Meanwhile, the gold flies had wings as bright and yellow as the sun. One resided in a beautiful meadow of flowers and grass, while the other went to the darkest caves so that their wings could shine even brighter. One day, a male gold fly got lost in his journey, and encountered one of the female green flies at the border where the two lands met. The two quickly fell in love, and eventually they hatched a beautiful and unique crystal fly, one where its wings were both green and gold. The young crystal fly's parents loved her dearly and did everything they could to take care of her. One day, they said to her, You are part of both swarms. Perhaps one day, you can be the one to bring everyone together again. The young crystal fly was hopeful that this would be true, but reality was not as kind. They lived in the meadow with the other green flies, and the family would often get treated horribly. The other green flies tried to force the gold fly to go back to his swarm in the caves. They berated the mother for daring to love a different type of crystal fly. And the special crystal fly was never truly seen as one of them. Some would even go as far to say she was an abomination. Feeling rejected by her own kind, she decided to live among the caverns as one of the gold flies. But the caverns were dangerous and unforgiving. She tried to make a home for herself there, but she wasn't able to grow accustomed to the harsh environment that surrounded her. Many of the other gold flies were just as bad as the green flies. One as weak as her could never be one of them. One with green in their wings tainted the powerful golden glow. A crystal fly like her would never belong in the caves with them. The lonely crystal fly left the caves and perched itself on a rock, watching the river slowly flow east. Then came a purple sisson from a faraway land who had come to visit the meadow for some time. My my little crystal fly, your wings are quite unique. The crystal fly began to sob. Oh sisson, my wings are nothing but a curse. Neither of the swarms accept me, but I always believed I could bridge the two worlds back together. The Sisson comforted the crystal fly. The future you envision of the two swarms will come to pass, but you should not be the one to carry that burden. My family is suffering. We've been bullied our whole lives, and we just want to be free from it all. I have a splendid idea, said the Sisson. I can take you and your family to a place where you won't have to worry about any of this. A place where your parents can be free to love each other, and a place where your special wings will not only be accepted, but adored by everyone. The crystal fly returned to her parents and told them about the Sisson's proposal. After much consideration, they chose to leave the swarms and start anew. They all flew far and wide, following the river east until they made it to a mountain, where the breeze felt nice and the weather was always clear. As they arrived, they found that the area was not only full of Sissons, but also butterflies, birds, and even other crystal flies of various colors. The family settled into their new home, and the lonely crystal fly was lonely no more. Her green and gold wings were beloved by her peers, and she finally had a place where she belonged. Alright class, story time's over. For extra credit, I have a pinned comment down below with some questions about the story. Don't be afraid to be right or wrong. This is just something to help you practice your story interpretation skills. But that's gonna do it for this episode of Character Creator. If you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. Let me know what aspects about her kit and story you liked, what you would change, and any alternative ideas you have. Thank you again for watching, and I will see you next time. Bye!